Lovers of lore, thank you for joining me for this installment of the Brothers War story. As usual with this story, we're going to be jumping around in time. So this part of the story takes place in 44 AR, 10 miles outside of Tomical. And this story follows Farid, a Falaji brass cap. Now he is stuck in an old war trench. Once upon a time, he had visions of glory, honor, and adventure, but those had slowly been crushed out of him as they were forced to continually retreat from Urza's forces. As a result, Farid and his unit found themselves in a 20-year-old trench. Now, it was full of water and corpses and rats, so they cleared it out as best they could. They got the bolt holes working properly so that they could hide from any kind of ornithopter raids that would occur. And at the same time, they set up traps outside the trench to sink any constructs that might come near. Once all these preparations were done, the days became more monotonous. Any well-trained soldier knew that orders for attack would only come with the presence of dragon engines or equivalent troops. So it was going to be a while before they saw any action. As a result, Farid spent his time maintaining his gear. He cleaned his spear, spent his time cooking, and also patching his boots and cloaks, something to do because the food was meager. At one point, a sergeant and their troop end up filing by, and Farid asks what's going on here. Are you being mobilized? And it turns out they're actually being moved to make room for replacements. So Farid kindly offers the sergeant a chicken bone, and food situation is so bad here that a chicken bone is seen as such a prize that the sergeant actually leaves him a gold coin in return. And that's enough to live like a king for a week. But Farid is actually a really nice guy. So he ends up letting his fellow soldier Carrick have it. Carrick was struggling with a wet cough. And Farid was so kind that when he made the weak soup that they had, he would actually feed Carrick first before himself to make sure that Carrick got the food that he needed. So while talking about these incoming replacements, they talked about how they hoped that they were Mishra's constructs and that they wouldn't be dealing with any more of those disgusting transmogrants. But there's a telling moment where Farid is actually fine with them using transmogrants if it means that he can get back to his home instead of being stuck out here in the war. But sadly, it turned out that the replacements were actually humans. And it turned out to be a motley assortment of old people, children, and criminals. And everyone but the criminals looked terrified. The criminals just looked angry. This turned out to be terrible luck for Farid, as an officer walked up to him and assigned 10 of these new recruits to his unit and specifically instructed Farid to guide these troops. Now, all of them except for one were children. The one who wasn't was a one-eyed veteran with a thousand-yard stare, just looking off into the distance. So Farid had his work cut out for him. The young ones wanted to know, how many battles have you seen? How many have you slain? And Farid laid out the stark reality for them. The battles aren't really conducted by the human troops. The human troops do the dying. The constructs run in and butcher everyone. And by the time you get there, everybody has already been wiped out. Now the young, brash troops who have just brought in, some of them are afraid, but a few of them have no idea what they're in for. So they start to call these old soldiers, Cowards, you need to stand up for Falaji. And at this point, the older soldiers are just having a laugh at them because these kids don't know anything. And Farid pulls out his knife and just doing that is enough for these kids to take a step back. But he turns around and jams it into the trench and he starts digging out part of a body that's just embedded in the wall. And he points at the trench and says, this trench is older than you are. You know nothing about war. And Farid, again, showing what a kind heart he is, right? He could just turn around and not explain this stuff to the kids. But he says, your boots and your cloaks are the most important things that you own. If we get attacked, you may have to run off at a moment's notice. There will always be another trench, but there won't always be new boots and cloaks. And you can get sick and die or get turned into a transmogrant. 
But the children at this point, as children are wont to do, don't really believe them. They're not really going in with it. But they disperse off, and at that point, Fareed turns and talks to the veteran. And it turns out that he's actually from a previous installment of the story. It's Ayman, the one who thought that Teferi's spirit form was actually death. So this is years later. Ayman has survived quite a bit. He is a veteran soldier now. And the higher rank officials start to show up with replacement gear and extra rations. This causes the new troops to get excited. Woo, we're getting all this extra stuff. This is fantastic. But the older soldiers are grumbling. They know what this means. When the officers show up and they start hassling the quartermasters to give out new patches for the cloak and to shine up all the metal and everything like that, it's because it's time to mobilize. And mobilizing means more danger. So ultimately, there is going to be some kind of movement soon, most likely an attack against the Argivians. So what happens is Iman, Carrick, and Farid plot to flee, but their plan to escape requires a fourth soldier. They're going to try and escape at night, and the night patrols are made up out of four people. So ultimately, after going through a list of different individuals, they settle on a young, biddable fellow by the name of Asan. He's barely old enough to even be a soldier at 14 years old. So this newly assembled squad heads over to meet with a corrupt sergeant that Fareed knows. He gives them an order chit, which will allow them to look like they're out on official business. And he hands over satchels. And the idea is they have to bring back one full satchel worth of goods, or the sergeant will basically rat them out and they will be imprisoned. So they head outside of the camp and make their way to a broken ornithopter and climb inside. It turns out this is actually a meeting place. And how it works is if you hang a white cloth outside of it, it indicates to the other side that you wish to trade with them. So ultimately this ends up working and four Argivian soldiers come into the wreck of the ornithopter as well, and they end up sharing their drinks and food, and then they bring the different items that they have to trade. So on the phalogy side, they had brought the bolts of silk and other things that the officers had just provided to them, and they got other things in return from the Argivians. At the same time, they also exchange information. Fareed decides to tell them that there is going to be an attack massing against them. They don't know exactly when, but it's coming soon, as indicated by the additional rations that they were provided. And the Argivians, for their part, are so grateful that they actually explain that their side knows the attack is coming and has prepared clay statues for a counterattack. So at this point, when the soldiers head back to the Falaji encampment, they know they have to keep their mouth shut, they can't say anything about what's going on, and sure enough, two days later, word comes down, it's time for an attack. They're going to go against the Argivians. So they start doing their raid. The bombs start dropping. All of that. But when they arrive at the Argivian trench, it turns out that the trench is empty. So Farid and his friends are ordered into the trench to search it while the rest of the troops head onwards. And what they actually find buried deep in a hidden corner of the trench is a tiny little piece of silk wrapped around a piece of chocolate with a note that says thank you. It was left by the Argivians. And it's a stark moment of humanity in this epic, insane war. And that's actually how this part of the story ends. For reading the others, don't get away as far as I know. Nothing happens in that regard. But at the same time, in the same area of the world, but not quite close enough to be seen, you have Teferi, who's still seeking his way through time. Now, if you're wondering why he's not having much luck, what he's doing to make his way through time is he's focusing on parts of the temporal tapestry that have holes in it where a bunch of lives were snuffed out all at once. So he's searching for the final great battle where a ton of lives were ended, but he keeps encountering these other massive battles where a ton of people have lost their lives. So while trying to deal with these time distortions that leave these holes, he ends up in these different locations. Teferi again finds himself in a battlefield. This is actually in 44 AR, not that far from where the events with Fareed just took place. There are tons of corpses strewn everywhere. In fact, in the story at some point, there are screams that are heard off in the distance, and that's most likely where Teferi ended up. 
But this is the aftermath of the battle. So Teferi is standing there, and all you can see is corpses everywhere. And he's sure this must be the last battle. So he looks about in every direction because he knows for a fact that at the last battle, Urza had his massive colossus that was made by the Sardian dwarves, and Gaia had summoned up a gigantic tree elemental, and they fought a titanic battle in the original story. So Teferi is looking around for those as some kind of landmark to indicate that this is indeed the last battle, but they're nowhere to be seen. All he sees is the dead, until he focuses on a little closer and realizes there are robed scavengers that are tearing apart construct for pieces, pulling out power stones, loading bodies onto carts. And then one of them looks up at Teferi, and he can see they have metal embedded in their face, and they ask, are you the voice from my dreams? Basically, these are Phyrexian priests, Gixians, and they believe that Teferi is Gix. And at that point, Teferi just takes off back through time to take another attempt at this. And that ends this installment of the story. If you haven't checked out the original Brothers War story, you're missing out a ton of details, including the titanic battle between the Colossus and the Elementals. You're going to want to check that out. And if you love what we're doing here, then support the channel on Patreon or by joining the channel membership. I'll see you for the next video. And remember, my friends, lore is life.